the church declare, Jesus Christ is King, for He conquered death once for all. We will live in light of His victory, following His gospel call. And when the story ends, we know Jesus wins, for this heart cannot be stopped. Nothing ever can, nothing ever will overcome the Lord our God. Nothing ever can, nothing ever will That was great. Man, I love that music. I love that song. And thanks for being in church today. How many of you are here because somebody asked you to come as their friend for Friend Day? Good. Several of you. So happy that you're here. And we're honored that you come. I'm a guest as well. I got to be here two years ago, shortly after I had stopped pastoring the First Baptist Church of Bridgeport. I ended May 19th, was here June 30th of that same year, 2019. But I got to tell you some things right up front. Uh, you need to know I have recently begun to associate rather strongly with the LFTB community. I hope that's all right. LFTB, that stands for Less Fat Than Before. I've lost 54 pounds since I went out as pastor. Now, I'm still, I'm still fat, but I now identify as skinny. So my pronouns are thin and slim, and uh, I'd appreciate it if you'd address me that way. I, I guess that makes me trans fat. I'm not sure. Uh, number two. I got to talk to you about COVID concerns. I am vaccinated. All right. So, but, uh, and I, I, when this thing started, I said to my wife, honey, if I get sick, I get sick. If I die, I die. But in the meantime, I'm going to live. But I respect your concerns. Now, I did not bring a mask with me, but if you want me to wear one, I will. Some people like me to do that just because it looks much better. I, <laughs> I go through security and the guy says, you have to take your mask down. I say, you'll be sorry. <laughs> I'm not paying for post-traumatic stress counseling. So, um, uh, But if you want a handshake, I'll shake your hand. Stick your hand out, I'll shake it. If you don't, don't stick it out. I won't shake it. I try to be respectful of wherever you are in that. If you want a hug, I'll hug you. If you want a kiss, you guys see the pastor. Uh, he'll, <laughs> he'll help you take care of that. And I'm also well aware that the only thing standing between you and hamburgers and hot dogs is me. And all you're going to be thinking is, how long is this going to last? So, and I feel like the fellow who was so unlucky that when he finally got his kidney transplant, it came from a bedwetter. But uh, <laughs> one of my mottos is, as, as, you, as you get older, one of my mottos is, if you can't be good, be short. All right? Believe me, there's plenty of times I've been neither. <laughs> so I want you to open your Bibles. Now, preacher, if it's all right, I'd like to read uh, for three versions uh, for our story today. Is it all right if I read three versions? The, uh, the first version is from Matthew chapter 8. The second is from Luke, uh, Mark chapter 4. And the third is from Luke chapter 8. They're all in your King James Bible. All right, brother. Uh, is that all right? Uh, last time I brought some books and some CDs. I did not bring any this time just because of the nature of how my travels were. Uh, so I don't have anything to sell. But if you want to leave money on the back table, that's still fine. You can do that. <laughs> Preacher, do you typically stand when you read the scripture here? Okay, stand with me if you would, please. I do whatever the preacher does as long as it's not illegal, immoral, unethical, or fattening. <laughs> well, three out of four is not bad, all right? Matthew chapter 8 and verse 23. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. Hey, there's a good idea. Disciples ought to follow Jesus. Amen, brother. I like that. 
And behold, there rose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful? O oh, ye of little faith! And he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Mark chapter 4, if you'd be willing to turn there with me. Beginning at verse 35 in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitudes, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say to him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly. I'm always amused when I read that. He challenges them about why you're fearful, and their response is to fear. <laughs> and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Luke chapter 8 and verse 22, if you would please. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over into the other side of the lake. And they launched for it, but as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy, saying, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Mm -hmm. Lord, I pray that you'd help me by your spirit to say the things that you want said. Lord, if there are people here today who don't know that they have a home in heaven, I pray they'd know that before they walk out of this building this day. And Lord, I pray that your children would be drawn close to you. And I pray that all you intend for this service would be accomplished. And I pray, Father, that you keep Satan and his demons from snatching the seed of your word out of the soil of our hearts, buying them. And help us to determine to be open and attentive and alert to what you have for us. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I just want to ask a question. I wonder if you say, Brother, will that... There is somebody in the service this morning, and I'm concerned about their eternal destiny. I'm praying that they'll come to know the Lord Jesus. I want you to pray with me about that. If that's true in your case, would you slip your hand up high? Anybody like that? God bless you. And Father, I pray now for these people who may not be sure they have a home in heaven. You love them. You want them to have everlasting life. And I pray that it be clear to them how much you love them and how eager you are for them to have absolute certainty of a home in heaven forever. And I pray that there be no one walk out of this room without being sure that heaven is their home. We'll thank you for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The Jews were not seagoing people. They were landlubbers. They didn't live by Lake Ontario. They... Uh, did have four expert sailors, though, in this ship. Sure. Peter and Andrew, James and John, before the Lord had called them to be disciples, had made their living on that exact same body of water. Sea of Galilee is about eight miles wide, about 13 miles long. It's surrounded largely by hills, and over time the wind has etched gullies into those hills, and it's not unusual for a big storm to come up rather rapidly. The Lord Jesus says, follow me, get into the ship, go to the other side of the lake. And so they are in the will of God. They're where God wants them to be, doing what God wants them to be, uh, to do, and a storm comes up. Well, I thought if you knew a lot, you never had any trouble. I saw that in the hooky pooky television station. If I do what God wants me to do, I'll always be rich and happy and healthy, especially if I send that rascal money. It's a bad storm. The disciples, all of them, including the expert sailors, are scared to death. I want you to think about number one tonight, or this morning, the reason for the storm. 
Why would a storm come to people who were in the will of God? Mm. I'm going to suggest one reason. You don't have to believe it. I think it makes sense, but I can't really prove it to you. My favorite Bible commentator is a man named John Phillips, a brilliant man who was a member of Bobby Robertson's church. Uh, Bobby Robertson never finished the eighth grade. John Phillips put himself under the authority of Bobby Robertson. John Phillips points out in the Gospel of Mark, the Bible says the Lord Jesus rebuked the wind and spoke to the waves. He said that word rebuke is most often used of rebuking unclean spirits. And so John Phillips said the devil, we know the devil's the prince of the power of the air. We know he likes to upset God's people and cause trouble for them. So he suggested that the storm was inspired by Satan. Can't prove that to you, but it makes sense. The devil does like to mess up your life. Yep. Know what he did to Job. You know that he's the accuser of the brethren. But there's a second reason for the storm, and you have to agree with this one. It's right in our text. People say, well, I had that trial because the Lord was testing me to see how I would respond. God wanted to see whether I'd be faithful. Um, wrong. Did you know that God has always known everything? <laughs> Did you know that God has never learned anything? My friend, Dr. Curtis Hudson used to say, did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God? <laughs> God never said, well, looky there. God has not looked down during the pandemic and said, oh my, what am I going to do? How are my churches going to survive? No. God knew exactly, the Lord Jesus knew exactly what the disciples would do. But you know what? They, they, the disciples, learned a whole lot. They knew the Lord Jesus could heal people from lameness and give sight to blind eyes and make deaf ears to hear and lepers to be cleansed. But now they find out he's more powerful than they thought because he controls even the elements. What manner of man is this? Even the winds and the sea obey him. And when the trial was over, the Lord Jesus didn't know one thing about the disciples he hadn't known before. But the disciples knew a whole lot more about Jesus. Hey, the trials of of life are designed to teach us about our God, about his power to deliver us, his able to, uh, ability to help us, his love and devotion for us, his consistency in all things. And God always wants to draw us to himself yep. through the storms of life. Amen. So the reason for the storm inspired by Satan, I think, instructive for the saints we know. But I want you to notice the response to the storm. The disciples are scared. They're really afraid. Yeah. Master, Master, we perish. We're going to die. You ever been scared? Yeah. And the Lord Jesus is sleeping. Does it ever seem to you that Jesus is asleep while you're in a storm? Hmm? Does it ever seem that way? The disciples are scared and Jesus is sleeping. Now, I would suggest to you that the Lord Jesus went to sleep on purpose. I've had people sleep when I preach. I never fuss at them. Because I believe in the law of sowing and reaping. When I was in college, I worked hard. I, I remember one, one year I was a night watchman, and every other night I'd work one night from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., the next night off, the next night from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. And uh, I also, at the same time, worked at a mattress factory. I'd work uh, four hours a day, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, eight hours on Tuesday and Thursday. Sometimes work a Saturday morning shift, and I was tired. I perfected the art of putting a hymn book under my elbow and my fist under my chin and sleeping in an upright position. So I'm owed people sleeping while I preach. I did hear about one preacher. I had an old guy who went to sleep every Sunday and he just had it. He said to his wife, you watch, I'm going to get him next week. He waited. The old guy was sleeping real well. And he said, everybody who wants to go to heaven when you die, would you please raise your hand? And everybody raised their hand except that old guy. By the way, anybody with any sense wants to go to heaven when they die. The Bible says it's appointed to men once to die after that, the judgment. When you die, you're either going to go to heaven or hell forever. One of the most compelling truths in the world is you've got to spend eternity someplace. 
your body dies, the real you, your soul and spirit are going to live in heaven or hell forever. And did you know God loves you and he wants you to go to heaven? He loves, he, he loves the whole world. Doesn't matter what you've done. One lady said, but I've done all these things and, and uh, will God forgive this? Will God forgive that? Will God forgive that? And the preacher she's talking to said, lady, if it's a contest between your ability to sin and God's ability to forgive, God's going to win every time. God. We're all sinners. The penalty of our sin is death and hell. We can't pay for our sin by being good or joining a church or giving away money or, or saying nice things to other people. No, the wages of sin is death. If I pay for my sin myself, I have to die and spend eternity in hell. But God loves us. He wasn't willing that any should perish. He doesn't want one person to die and go to hell. He wants the whole world to have everlasting life. Yes. But we owe the penalty of death. Can't pay for our sin by church membership, baptism, good works. But here's what the Bible says. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Ha! The wages of sin is death. Jesus died for us. He paid the wages of sin. God sent his son. The Lord Jesus has always been God. Became man, born of a virgin in Bethlehem's manger. Never sinned one time. And after 33 years on this earth, he allowed men to nail him to a cross and put him up on that cross where he bled and died. And he died for us. Wait a minute. If the wages of sin is death and Jesus died in our place, he paid the penalty we owe. That's what the Bible says. The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. i got two choices. I can pay for my sin myself by dying and going to hell, or I can accept the gift of eternal life by trusting Jesus and Him alone to be my Savior. You don't have to be real smart to know which one's a better deal. Yes, sir. Amen. God wants you to go to heaven. Amen. So He said, everybody wants to go to heaven when you die. Raise your hand. And then He said, everybody wants to go to hell when you die. Would you please stand up? And the old guy woke up. He jumped to his feet. And he looked around. And he said, Preacher, I don't know what it is we're voting on, but it looks like you and me are the only ones for it. I've had people sleep when I preach, but I never had anybody come to church, take a pillow, put it down on the chair, and lay down on the pillow. And Jesus is asleep on a pillow. I think he did it on purpose. I think he did everything he ever did on purpose. <laughs> Response to the storm. The disciples are scared. The Lord is sleeping. But the ship is safe. Now this is pretty amazing. Anybody own a boat? Any boat owners? We must have some. Sorry, I'm not preaching against it. Yeah, I've, owned, I've known the two happiest days of a boat owner. The day I bought my boat and the day I sold my boat. <laughs> if you got a boat, you're always going to get some water in it. Always. You got a little 16 foot fishing boat with a 25 horse motor, you got a milk jug that you kind of cut open and you scoop up the water from the bottom of the boat. If you got a bigger boat, it's got a bilge pump in it. And there's a system where the water runs under the bottom of the boat and goes to the back. It's kind of like a miniature sump pump and it pumps the water out. Any boat's going to have some water in it, but I don't know of any boat that is designed to be filled with water. And the Bible says their ship was full. You know what happens when a boat gets full of water? Yeah. It sinks. That's the end of it. It's over. But not this ship. It was covered with waves. The ship was full, but this ship doesn't sink. You know why? Not because there's anything, anything special about the boat. Not because there was anything expert about the sailors. Oh, no. The reason the ship doesn't sink is because Jesus is in the boat. We used to sing, Master, the tempest is raging. And we'd sing, No tempest can swallow the ship where lies the master of ocean and earth and skies. Hey, you better be sure you're in the boat with Jesus if you want to survive the storms of life. They followed Jesus. You ever wonder why some people seem to have peace in the midst of terrible trials and able to smile in the midst of an awful storm? It's because they're in the boat with Jesus. The response to the storm, the disciples are scared. The Lord Jesus is sleeping. The ship is safe. And then there comes a rebuke. 
There is a calming rebuke. The Lord Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves and they stop. I mean, they don't gradually get better. They don't die off. They just stop. Did you know all the burdens and trials and heartaches of life can be over as fast as they started? A calming rebuke. Somebody said my favorite verse in the Bible is, and it came to pass. Praise God, it didn't come to stay. Amen, <laughs> this too shall pass. One of these days we'll understand the whole thing better, the old song says. One of these days we're going to come to know the reason why. After this life with all of its sorrow, we're going to find a greater tomorrow. We'll live on in happiness forever one of these days. Did you know for the child of God, it's great joy in life. Jesus said, I'm coming. You might have life and have it more abundantly. But did you know for the child of God, the best is yet to come. <laughs> one lady said, I want to be buried with a fork. I said, why? She said, whenever I ate, if they said, keep your fork, it meant dessert was coming. Something good was on the way. And I want everybody to know I'm going on to eternal life with my Savior. Something good is on the way. Amen. I'm more like the person who said, life is short and uncertain. Eat dessert first. <laughs> a calming rebuke. And then there's a convicting rebuke. And the Lord Jesus convicts the disciples about two things. Number one, about fear. Why are you afraid? Why are you so fearful? We live in an era where government and media and others use fear to control people. They try to. The, Michael Crichton wrote the book Jurassic Park, uh, and uh, he wrote another book called The State of Fear fiction book, but all about that thesis. And the Lord Jesus said, why are you afraid? Hey, what scares you? COVID? Overreaching government? Social Security going bankrupt? Don't worry, it's been bankrupt for years. <laughs> what scares you? Poor health? <laughs> Running out of money, not having anything for your retirement, your spouse leaving you? What scares you? What keeps you awake at night? What do you worry about? And the Lord Jesus says, why? Why? Huh. Well, you say, Brother Lat, I mean, I'm, I'm, this kind of runs in my family, and this, it, I, I might have this bad sickness. Well, yeah, then what? Well, well, well but then I, I get really sick. Well, then what? Well, I, 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 I might die. Well, then what? Hey, I got news for you. Ain't none of us getting out of this thing alive. Unless we live till the Lord Jesus comes back. Everybody's going to die. But if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, my Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The greatest thing you can know in all the world is that God loves you and he wants you to have an assurance of everlasting life in heaven. Did you know that you never have to spend one minute in the devil's hell? Did you know if you'll trust Jesus as your Savior, you never have to answer for one of the bad things you've ever done? Your preacher mentioned Awana. One of the first times I preached at First Baptist Church of Bridge, but I was there for their Awana. I had a tiny little building. They used a, a school to have Awana on a Monday night. And I remember preaching and I gave the gospel and some kids came to, to, to come to know the Lord Jesus. And this one little kid looked at me and said, Mister, are we going to get saved right now? Yeah. That's the only time you can guarantee you can get saved is right now. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. So why are you scared? John Rice, the great evangelist of a bygone era, had a man come up, stick a gun in his stomach and say to him, I'm going to blow your brains out. <laughs> Not a biology major. <laughs> and John Rice looked at the man, never influenced. He said, you can't scare me with heaven. Amen. That's huh. good, brother. That's good. There's a great old preacher named him Roe Parker. He did a meeting in Kentucky years and years ago. He took the train down to this holler where police didn't like to come. And the old preacher met him at the train station and said, hurry, get in a car. There's going to be trouble. So he got in a car. 
A preacher said, you know, the last evangelist was here. They shot and killed him while he was standing in the pulpit. And the same bullet that killed him went through his body and hit his wife at the piano and killed her. They had a prayer meeting Saturday night before the Sunday start of the meeting. And they were praying like this. Oh, God, don't let Dr. Parker die. Oh, God, don't let Dr. Parker die. And Earl Parker said, you could hear my fervent amens intermingled with their prayers. It was a rough meeting. It's a tough guy standing around with their six guns on, leaning against the wall of the back there, and the preacher to say anything they didn't like. One night during the meeting, they turned the lights off. They beat the old preacher up. They broke his glasses. They stole his fountain pen. And Monroe Parker had had all he could take. Monroe Parker was an athlete, a very strong man. He used to do headstands and then do push-ups. Go home and try that. We'll know who did by the neck braces on Wednesday. <laughs> and he picked up the pulpit and he put it aside and he said, you bunch of cowards. Beat up an old man in the dark, break his glasses, steal his fountain pen. He said, you big shots, go around with your guns pointed at your heels. You better be careful. They might go off accidentally and blow your brains out. <laughs> they didn't teach much biology in those days. And then he said this. Everybody's saying, oh, God, don't let Dr. Parker die. Oh, God, don't let Dr. Parker die. You can't kill me. I'm going to live as long as God lives. Hey, so am I. And if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, so are you. Amen. Rebuke about fear. Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? You know, you ought to be afraid of dying and going to hell. That's a very scary thing. The Bible says some say by fear, delivering them as brands from the burning and others have compassion, making a difference. But that fear can be eliminated in an instant. The moment you say, yes, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thinking of a man named Dick Allen was in our church, a buyer for General Motors, executive, lived in a beautiful home and uh, raised in church. And one night I went over and gave him the gospel and he said, huh? He said, all my life, I thought you got to heaven by being good. I never knew you got to heaven by trusting Jesus, trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior, faithful member of our church till the day he died and went to heaven. My dad is from Massachusetts. He got out of the army after World War II. And he, he worked a little bit in a factory in Springfield, Massachusetts. And then he said, I'm going to go to college in the GI Bill. So he got on the bus and went to Columbia to enroll in New York City. Dwight Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces, who was by then the president at Columbia. And dad said, well, it's good enough for Ike. It's good enough for me. I thought he'd be a radio announcer. He had a deep, rich voice. On the bus on the way back, he met two guys that had been in his neighborhood when he was a boy. My dad never went to church and never heard the gospel. And these boys were the only boys in his neighborhood that went to church but didn't go to a Catholic church. What are you going to do? Oh, he said, I'm going to Columbia to be a radio announcer. Hey, they said, you ought to go to our college. We've got a radio program there. We have our own radio station. He said, where do you go to college? They said, we go to Bob Jones University. It just moved to Greenville, South Carolina. And they impressed him. They were something different about them, their spirit, their attitude, their appearance. They got my dad's information, address, and Bob Jones sent him some information. Columbia sent him stuff, but he got accepted at Bob Jones before he got accepted at Columbia. And on a whim, he said, well, I like the South. I was in the South when I was in the service. I'll go to that school in the South. In January 1949, he got on a bus and rode from Massachusetts to South Carolina. They began every semester in those days with revival services, and a fiery old evangelist named Bob Jones Sr. stood up preaching. He said, young man, what if your mother knew everything you'd ever done? 3,000 people there. My dad thought he was talking to him. He said, oh, I wouldn't want my mother to know everything I'd ever done. God knows. God knows everything I've ever thought or said or done and everything you've ever thought or said or done. But you know what? There's a great line in an old song. It says, the one who knows me best loves me most. <laughs> See, God doesn't love you because of who you are. God loves you because of who he is. God is love. And then he gave the gospel. My dad heard for the first time in his life that he was a sinner. He knew that. 
that his sin made him unqualified for heaven. He pretty well knew that. But that God loved him so much, he sent Jesus to die on the cross and pay for his sin. And if he'd believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he could have everlasting life. And my dad, sitting in his seat, said, wow, that sounds like a good deal to me. Yes, sir. Yeah. It is a good deal. It's the best deal you'll ever know. Dad trusted Christ as his Savior that night, never turned back, lived to be 91 and 70 years later, still pointed that time as the time that changed his life, became a preacher, a servant of God. God used him in a tremendous way, one of the best men I ever knew. It all started because somebody told him the gospel. It's all right to be afraid of dying and going to hell, but you don't have to be afraid of it anymore. You can know Jesus before you walk out of this room. Amen. Why are you so afraid? God has not given us the spirit of fear. I don't know, but maybe there's somebody watching on live stream, and I'm so glad you're watching, and I understand a lot of things going on out there, but maybe it's time to come back to church. Amen. Maybe it's time to just say, it'll be all right. I'll trust God. God will take care of me. He rebuked him about fear, and then he rebuked him about faith. And I like this. He said, where is your faith? That's interesting. Now, we misunderstand faith. We think faith is, uh, it'll be fine, God will take care of everything's all right, I'm not worried. There are some people who seem to have that kind of faith. But I remember this guy in the Bible, he came to the Lord Jesus, and he said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Huh? Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Lord, I'm fat, help thou my skinniness. <laughs> Lord, I'm hairy, help thou my baldness. Three Hebrew children, remember them? Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. Thou hast prepared, and he will deliver us, O king. Amen. You know the next three words they said? But if not, <laughs> faith is not the absence of doubt. Faith is obeying God in spite of your Amen, doubt. Brother. Amen. Preacher has an outreach emphasis and encourages everybody to go and knock on doors and you're scared to death. You're so scared you're sweating all the way down to your belt. You're so scared you don't have to knock on the door. You hold your hand up, it's knocking already. But if you went, you demonstrated faith. It's not the amount of your faith that makes a difference. It's the object of your faith. The Bible never says you have to have an intense faith to be saved, but it does say your faith in the Lord Jesus must be exclusive. You only trust Jesus, not Jesus and good works, not Jesus and baptism, not Jesus and uh, church membership, just Jesus. Where is your faith? How many of you drove here this morning? How many of you came to an intersection and you had a green light? I know what you did. You slowed down very carefully. You looked both ways. You made absolutely sure no one else was coming. Then you eased through the intersection. No, you didn't. Light was green. Zoom. You went on through. Some of you, the lights started to turn yellow and you mashed down the accelerator and tried to get through before the camera clicked. You have no idea who was driving the cars in the street coming across. There could have been teenagers in those cars. But you had faith that perfect strangers would stop because the light was red. Where's your faith? Uh, preacher, who made these chairs? You don't know? Well, one of you knows, who made these chairs? Well, how much weight are they rated for? Well, what if they don't hold you up? I've been in meetings. I was in meetings at the Michigan Association of Christian Schools, and a guy was sitting in a chair, and he just whomp, bent down while he was sitting there. <laughs> it's very embarrassing. I shouldn't tell you this, but... It was one of those chairs, we were in a fancy motel, had a back and a seat, and the, the kind of like aluminum or steel things came under the, that, that man in the back, under the seat, went like this and went like that. And so that, it just kind of squeezed together. So he was standing for a while, and while nobody's looking, I took the chair and I pulled it back apart. And I said, hey, here's a chair for you, brother. And he sat down in it, and a few minutes later, it did it again. <laughs> I, I have a twisted mind, I really do. What if you're sitting in this chair and you collapse right here in front of all these people? Wouldn't that be embarrassing? Now, we'd help you. Right after we took your picture and put it on Instagram, we would, <laughs> we would come to your assistance. 
but you had faith. That somebody you don't know designed a chair that holds your weight. And some of you didn't just ease down into it either. You kind of plopped. Where's your faith? Is it in your ability to make a living? Is it in your intelligence? Is it in your spouse's care for you? Is it in the money you have in the bank? Is it in the fact that you have some social security retirement? The Bible says have faith in God. Only way anybody gets to heaven is by faith. God's grace already sent Jesus to die on the cross. Your faith says, Jesus, I'm going to trust you and you alone to forgive my sin and give me eternal life in heaven. And the only way anybody lives the Christian life in a way that ha makes God happy is if they live by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. What are you doing right now that is beyond your reason? What are you doing that you're not quite sure it's going to work, but you know God wants you to do it, so you're trying it anyway? What are you doing that requires faith? Pastor, a good-sized church for 44 years, I had a lot to do, and I'd preach out 55, sometimes 60 times a year while I was doing that. I put out a little paper every month called The Preacher's Page. I wrote articles for every issue of the Sword of the Lord for a long time. I wrote articles, still do, for the Baptist Voice every time they would come out. I had a lot going on. And every time I'd about get it figured out, do this on this day, this on this day, this at this time, and they go, okay, I think I can manage it. Then God would come along and say, good, now I want you to step out of that circle and do this too. And I'd say, Lord, I just got that figured out. And Lord said, yeah, you had it figured out. I don't want you trusting your schedule. I don't want you trusting your organization. I want you trusting me. What are you doing in your life now? It requires faith. Or maybe I should ask this question. What do you know God wants you to do? And you've been a little hesitant. But it will require faith. A rebuke about fear, a rebuke about faith. Well, What's the story teaches? Let me give you a few reminders. Number one, storms are normal. It's okay. You're not out of the will of God because you have a storm. You'll be following Jesus right into the boat and still have a storm. Doesn't mean you're a bad person. Doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. Storms are normal. Number two, the devil can mess up your life, but he can't sink your ship. He can make the waves come and bounce your little boat around, but he can't make it go under. I'll tell you why. Because if you're in the boat with Jesus, you'll survive storms that'll sink everybody else. Nothing better in the world than to know Jesus is your Savior. Amen. Know that you have everlasting life. Know that he'll never leave you or forsake you. Amen. Next lesson is this. Fear is normal, but it's not necessary. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That word sound has the idea of being disciplined. I being of sound mind, a sane mind and sound body. The economy is as sound as a dollar. Your preacher's a weightlifter. I used to be a weightlifter. The weight is still there. The lift is just gone. Uh, he disciplines his body. God says, I want you to discipline your body. I want you to have a sound mind. I, I want you to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. God and not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Fear is normal, but it's not necessary. The psalmist said, what time I'm afraid I will trust in thee. And then he said again, I'll trust and never be afraid. And then I want you to notice this. It is sinful not to exercise faith. What sort is not a faith is sin. sin. God wants us to live by faith and not by sight. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. I read about a Superman movie. And it's, uh, you know, Superman's uh, faster than a speeding bullet and more powerful than a locomotive and able to leap tall buildings at a single bound, otherwise known as a church secretary. <laughs> It said that in this movie, Superman went down and rescued a guy from a burning building. 
Now he's flying up really high and really fast. And the guy looks down. The buildings are the size. They look like they're made of Legos. And the people look like they're ants. And the guy gets scared. And Superman gets upset with him. That's what it says. He said, hey, man, I didn't fly all the way down there and grab you out of that burning building just to drop you on the way home. I wonder if God doesn't look at his fearful and faithless children sometimes and say, why are you so afraid? Where is your faith? I wonder if he doesn't say, I didn't come down in the person of my son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and have all the sins of all the world paid for. I did not lift you out of a miry clay and set your feet on a rock and establish your going and put a new song in your heart. I did not indwell you by my spirit and write your name down in the Lamb's book of life in indelible ink just to drop you on the way home. That's right, brother. That's a good point. Amen. Amen. Lord, Thanks that you love us. I pray every person here would know how much you love them. At least know more how much you love them than they did a few moments ago. And I pray you'd speak to all of our hearts and I pray you'd give me your mind as I extend the invitation. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, nobody's looking around. I wonder who's here this morning and you say, Brother Willette, I'd go to heaven if I died right now because I've trusted the Lord Jesus. But the Spirit of God's dealt with me about my fear. And he's saying to me, why are you so fearful? And I'm reminded that God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I'm God's child and heaven's my home, but God's dealing with me about my fear. I wish you'd pray with me about that. If you'd say that, would you hold your hand up high? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. And then I wonder if you're here this morning you say, I'm God's child. I've trusted the Lord Jesus as my Savior. I know heaven's my home. But God's dealt with me about my faith. He's asking me the question, where is your faith? And I'm not sure I could point anything out in my life that I'm requiring God's grace to do and doing only because of faith. I'm God's child, but God's dealt with me about faith in my life, and I wish you'd pray with me about that. If you say that, would you hold your hand up high? Thank you. Good number of hands responding. Thank you for that. And then, I wonder if you're here this morning and you say, I don't know I'd go to heaven if I died right now. I'd like to know that, but I don't. I'd like to pray for you. Now, just a minute. I, a lot of people raised their hands a moment ago, and I didn't call individual attention to a single one of them. Didn't point them out in any way. I will call no more attention to you now than I did to them then. But I'd like to include you in the prayer. I wonder who would say, I don't know who going to heaven, but I wish I did. If I could be sure that all my sins are forgiven, I never had to answer for any of the bad things I've ever done, that the moment I left this earth, I'd be in heaven forever. If I could be sure about that, I, I'd like to be sure about that. I, I'm not, but I wish I was. Pray for me if you say that. Would you slip up your hand right where you sit? I'm not sure I'm going to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Thank you. God bless you, and God bless you. I see those hands. Who else? I'm not sure of heaven. I want to be sure. Pray for me. I've seen two hands. Who else would say that? I don't know I'm going to heaven, but I wish I did. Let me ask the question this way. I wonder who could say, I am sure of heaven because I've trusted Jesus. I know that if I died today, I'd go to heaven, not because I deserve it, because I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you could say that as a testimony to that, would you slip your hand up high right where you sit? God bless you. Most of us could raise our hands, and I appreciate that. I'm up a couple steps, and I could see, and I could see people couldn't raise the hand and say, I am sure I'm going to heaven, but didn't raise the hand earlier and say, I'd like to be sure that I'm going to heaven. Now, you're honest to not raise your hand when other people did. I wouldn't have known the difference. You would have. God would have. I wouldn't have. And I want you to be honest one more time. Because I'll tell you what I know is true. I know it's true people have been praying, maybe praying for you by name. Certainly praying for anybody that'd be here that wasn't sure they had a home in heaven. I know it is true that the Spirit of God convicts us of our need for a Savior. All that uncertainty, that racing of your heart, that unease now, that wishing that I'd just get done and go on to the next part of the day. That's conviction. That's the Holy Spirit saying, you need to do this, you ought to settle this. 
you're honest to not raise your hand when other people did. Would you be honest one more time? It wouldn't be honest to raise your hand to, and say something's true when it's not true. You didn't do that. But it wouldn't be honest to not acknowledge something to be true that is true. And it is true that God's dealing with your heart, isn't it? I wonder who would say, I couldn't raise the hand and say, I'm sure I'm going to heaven. I didn't raise it before and ask you to pray for me that I will be sure of heaven, but I'd like to be sure of heaven. And I'll acknowledge, yes, the Spirit of God spoke in my heart. There's something going on inside me. I wish I knew I was going to heaven. Pray for me. When you pray for the other folks, you who say that, slip your hand up right quick. Would you do that? Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Let's see another hand. I appreciate that. Father, I pray earnestly. For those whose hands were raised to say, I'm not sure of heaven, but I want to be sure. Save them today. Lord, make it really clear that you want them to allow somebody to open your book and show them how they can have eternal life. I pray that when the invitation begins, they would come with others who are coming and they'd slip out of the seat and let somebody help them. And then, Lord, I pray for all of your children. I pray there'd be no hesitation that no one would wait or worry about what others would think, but we'd all be obedient to your spirit. Thank you that many have lifted a hand. I pray that all of them would also bend the knee. And Lord, I know you'll use their obedience to make it easier for others to obey, others to respond. So help it to be so. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would Thank you so much for watching our services today. We hope you enjoyed them very much. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you liked and subscribed to this channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you. If you can email us at mylbbc at gmail.com, we're going to send you this book. It's called Done, What Most Religions Do Not Teach You about the Bible. It tells you how you can have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, if you'd like to find out more about our church and our church family, you can visit us at lbbc.info. God bless you. Thank you for watching this video. Have a good day.